Greetings, thank you each for your presence. I am joined by the fantastic, world-renowned Mr. Astrotheology Santos Bonacci today to talk about Pisces. Yes, this is the 12th and conclusive part of our Astrology of the Zodiac series. Thank you so much for joining me, Santos. Yeah, brother, just looking for something. Uh, thank you. I'm back. <laughs> you, you never left. We're all present here. And it's very exciting that we're talking about that kind of paradoxical, mutable water sign, the 12th sign of Pisces today. Yep, yep. It's my moon sign, so I understand it quite well. And uh, I'm pretty keen to talk a little bit about it and see what I can um, share. Brilliant. I've got Jupiter and Mars in Pisces. And my mum is a Pisces sun and Mercury. So I'm familiar with it. But also, I've got the old Neptune conjunct my Capricorn sun. So it's all just a mist to me. But this is a mystery story. The Pisces element is a bit like where we can find captivation. We can find that we are actually within something and yet we're outside of something too. It's a paradox. It's two fish. It's this and that. Uh, and it creates a change through the churning of the mystical waters that we experience through this kind of Neptunian, Jupiterian land of the, the ether. How do you like to feel into this kind of quality, Santos? Yeah, look, um, it's, um, it's a fascinating sign. It's about 12 and completion. Uh, and so those people seem to have some kind of a connection with their uh, old soul self. Uh, and so it, it seems that they've completed their 12 labors somehow. But um, yeah, I think it um, carries a lot of karma with it as well. It's um, heavy laden with karma sort of um, uh, meanings. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it shows through in their emotional nature. They're very emotional, very sensitive. Um, they so seem to be telepathic and... Um, you know, psychic as well. So they've, they've got a lot of this Pisceans. Um, there's a lot of occultists that are into, um, that are Pisceans, you know, like uh, I think um, Edgar Casey, Manly P. Hall, a lot of uh, interesting people go deep, deep, deep into uh, theology. So they've got their, you know, they're awakened somehow. Would you suggest that with regards to this quality of the 12th sign, it can be a bit like a grand accumulation of lifetimes? And uh, so it's a bit like if, if Scorpio is like the, the, the bogged down water that sometimes flushes through, and then Pisces is like everything that ever has been and everything that ever will be, but can it be fathomed at this moment? It's like, what can you gather and collect? What can you bring forth? It's like, that twilight zone where you're just before something new and yet you're just after something old. But yet if you can bring something through of both of those, then you're just going to be there, bold, a story ever told. It's kind of this poet, poetic, whimsical kind of thing, but you can kind of get lost in it very easily. It's like, I've just got a fog, but it's clear for all to see. <laughs> How do you think and perceive of this stuff, Santos? <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of vagueness about them, but there's also um, sometimes they get very, very certain. The one fish is doubting, the other fish has got a lot of faith. So you see them really motivating other people, you know, um, finishing up and tidying. They're good finishers. They, um, they tidy up things really well and make sure that everything's in order that the cardinal signs started and left unfinished. I find I've had, um, well, my first wife was Piscean. She was very orderly, very organized. And yeah, one of my other partners, which was um, uh, of duration of about a year or two as well. I've had two partners in my life of, Pis of Pisces that I related to through my moon and they were both very very organized um paid attention to detail i found I, I don't know whether it was just their astrology but um i attribute that to, to pisces i find that that's their um 
their qualities as well. You know, so being a immutable... like chaos and order, so the omnipresence, they just know where those keys are around the back of the sofa. They just know certain things because they feel it very perceptive. Spot on, brother. Yeah. Opposite Virgo, which is very analytical, they're not so like that, but um, their forte is belief and faith, whereas Virgo is skeptical and doubting. Uh, Pisces are uh, compassionate, whereas Virgos are critical. Pisces are mystic and mystics, they are into Virgos are into science. Well, that would be, you know, physics and um, material science, obviously, because mysticism is spiritual science. I mean, uh, the Pisces are all about the one. Virgo is all about the many. Pisces is about the whole. Uh, Virgo is about the parts. Pisces undifferentiated. Virgo differentiated. Pisces togetherness. Virgo separateness. Pisces merging. Virgo dividing. So both mutables have their opposite functions. And that's the interesting thing about, um, about good old little Pisces there. Um, having a moon in Pisces uh, teaches you how, how I react. So when you get a reaction from me, it'll either be one or the other of my split emotional nature because it is split and the moon is how one reacts. And so I find that I've always had healthy doubt and healthy belief. And I flip flop from the one to the other. So yeah, flip flopping is very, very, um, consistent with Pisces nature, they don't, um, they don't seem to, um, what's the word when you um, accept a responsibility and stick with it? They're flaky. What's the opposite of flaky? Not committal. Yes, that's the word I was looking for. They tend to not commit, you know, um, let me think about it. Uh, tentatively, we'll book it for Friday. <laughs> and then they change their mind anyway. Uh, because of their emotional nature they let their emotions dominate it's very right. funny because funny they're quite devotional but if there's an opportunity which there is always the an opportunity to slip free of the net <laughs> then you will and you can and you shall true true yeah they're very slippery uh wishy-washy <laughs> at worst um and you know that that visionary stuff of theirs as well can sometimes be um uh, when it's negative, it can be very foggy-minded and delusional and um, stressed out. They, they, they do carry a lot of stress. I find that they have a lot of fears as well. They live under a lot of fear somehow, Pisceans. Lots of stress. It takes uh, a tremendous command to be able to wield that energy because it's the storytelling energy. So it's either going to be sending you do lally into some kind of ferocious story if you tell if you tell that but if you have the grasp on your own matter if you have a grasp on your own material if you have a grasp on something a container or a frame for this uh, gift then you become the mage the magi who is able to really tell a tale who's really able to tell one's own story who's able to really sew their own shadow back on which takes mastery it's like bringing it all together we we recognise that it can be our own downfall if we get too, you know, swept away in one's own mysticism, I would imagine. It's it's good. I'm talking to, like, someone who's got Capricorn Sun, so obviously I'm brought right that down to Earth. But this is um, a necessity, and a component is all of the zodiac is all inclusive. So thank goodness for the other signs. But this is like a portal which allows us to channel everything through. Like, if you think about the time of the day, it's the... Uh, 4 a.m., all the birds are which are the bards. They're telling the story. And so the, the REM sleeps going banana inside of our brain, the diphenyltryptamine, the spirit molecule, the Christos, the Christ is being pumped all around us. And that's what's allowing us to build this connection. 
our connection to the ethers, our connection <coughs> to like the brain cloud, to the storm of it all, is um, is that moment there? I suppose that's a, my antithesis of like the Pisces energy. But that's just their day to day life. That's just our experience. We've all got Pisces. We all have a twelfth house. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good point. So everyone has that um, that ability to a certain extent, but Pisceans are masters of that. So um... when we talk about again, like these two fish, like, and they're like, like where they're separated at birth. Sometimes you tell to hear the story of the Romulus and the Remus, or you, or like the twins in general, or the two lovers, the twin flames. But these two, they've got an unbelievable core or connection, like in the the actual sky, in the way that this this is like these two stars of Pisces are represented. And so there's a beauty in finding each other. But then, whenever you do find each other, it's the beauty in being able to let go once more, which is so profoundly heart wrenching, which conjures so much love once more for the self as well as the other. It's kind of heart wrenchingly beautiful, right? It is. Yeah, for sure. When um, when they balance their two fish out, they're quite um, interesting people to have around. Good friends. Um, yeah, I think loyalty is one of their uh, virtues as well. So, um, and uh, it rules the feet, of course, must be remembered. They're very much uh, about the feet. They often get cold feet, itchy feet. Um, Usually they're pretty good dancers, sportsmen as well, sports people, um, runners, especially. Um, you know, they're always uh, using their feet to bring about the the, um, the good news that they like to share. So they're the fisher of the fishers of men. <clears throat> That's what Pisces is. When when Jesus is called fisher of man, it's it's dealing basically with Pisces, right? Oh yeah. So they what the is they'll surrender uh, their own self to awaken another they'll bear their soul and so mm. in doing this what they do is they're like i'm going to put myself out all day long just to awaken these guys who are lollygagging on the fact that they can love themselves and each other a little bit more this is the kind of um experience that a pisces would do they, they, they show their con compassion and their outpouring love for others to be a leading example of what love or Christ does, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So bringing people together in the fold is what they do, a fisher of men, you know, not a fish. So- That's what a fisher of men is, isn't it? So mm. to, to, to catch them into the wave, to catch them into the, the collective consciousness. Yes, yes. What's the story of the fisher of men? Well, that was Jesus, right? So he was bringing his 12 apostles together. Of course, he's going to be called the fisher of men. And the first two apostles that he finds is uh, Andrew and um, Cephas. Well, Andromeda and Cephas are two deacons of Pisces, together with the fish band. So Andromeda, Andrew, Cephas, Peter. Um, Cephas is the constellation that stands with his right foot on the north on Polaris, and he's the most northern constellation together with Draco and all of these circumpolar um, constellations. But Cephas, uh, Peter, Jupiter, Zeus, um, see, when Peter came up, he said, my name is Peter, and this is my brother, Andrew. And Jesus said, I will call you Cephas, the rock. Well, Cephas with his foot standing on Polaris, that's the rock. And as the firmament turns around Polaris day in, day out, Cephas is always there with his foot there, firmly fixed. So it's like a rock. And you see, and then he went in to see his, I think, Peter's wife, who was um, death bound and sick. Well, that's Cassiopeia. Um, that's in Aries next door. So the whole story is on the ecliptic. All the stories come from there. They're all drawn from the ecliptic. So and so... Kiss the feet, don't they, as well, in many cultures, because of the, the amount of fortune that's carried in the soul, very Jupiterian. 
Uh, well, that's where the soul is um, projected from, the feet and the hands. So you have a, the sole of your foot and the palm of your hand. Well, palm, if you remove the P, you get alm, alms, religious alms. Well, in Spanish, alma is a soul. So you've got soul projecting from your palms, alma, and you've got souls in, in your feet. And that's why um, when they do... Um, that's like sun, isn't it? So soul is the sun. We've got the sun in our feet. That's why you always put your palms up to the lamp, the lamb of God, the sun. Palm is, in the, is an anagram for lamp. And that's, there's, there's two uh, portals. In males, the sun's mag magnetic currents are drawn in through the right hand and then return to the sun through the left. So when you're doing this, like Akhenaten taught us, and you're um, solar gazing, you're actually creating a loop and charging your body. And that um, current is now turning your chakras, every one of them. So that's why it's so important to have your palms, alma, facing the sun. That's amazing, isn't it? Like the, the, my favorite thing about astrology is how much it comes back to this being the language for our starship, like the body being our starship or our, our greatest vessel like our spirit vehicle, it's really like the handbook to the Merkaba, if you will, to the, which I think is just brilliant because it's our connection that we're marrying into as a spirit. We're marrying into this body and we want to know how to use it and how and to relate to it. And this language opens us up to that. Yep, it does. Uh, Pisces is um, the last sign of the wave. And so... It stitches up. The two fish are like a stitching. Um, and, and at the end of Pisces, March 20th, there is the equinox. So those fish are depicting the, the two halves of the wave, the summer half and the winter half, coming together. Well, the same thing happened when at the other equinox where Libra, begins the seventh sign libra is judging the equinox right oh the sun had a good year during the summer now it's saturn's turn to control the winter and balancing the the, the two major seasons so libra kicks it off this duality this other half and pisces the two fish stitch it up and that's why the symbol for Pisces is two halves of a circle and a line through the middle. That's the, it's the Taurus field or the hyperbola intersected by the plane of inertia. It's just a very, very simple toroidal field symbol. So, yeah, so that, this, this is the Pisces symbol, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so it's like the two fish are actually representing the two sides of the toroid or what is actually an atom. Um, so this is the beauty of it, is that actually it's this interconnected singularity that we get from the, the doubt and the faith. If we can bring it to the center of that space, then we are this individual spark or the bolt of a current in the middle. Yeah, that's, that's more like it. So that's like also we see this logo they utilize it in car designs like uh, and many different uh, logos steal off the pisces because it's actually very much represented of this toroid field yeah well there i've put in the hyperbola the hourglass in the middle and then you can see the two um toroidal fields and then the plane of inertia is that thing there which uh is where counter space is right there in the middle and so Pisces in, in the center of that is just a cross section of the Taurus field as are all the other symbols of uh, astrology. Taurus, Aries, they all come from the Taurus field. Gemini, these are the two twins, Gemini, the two pillars. So it's Boas and Jackin. So you'll have up to two pillars of Gemini going straight down there, you see? And then Cancer, 
69, 6 and a 9 coming together. Um, and they all they all are cross sections of this, as so are the numbers and the letters of all alphabets. On, the central space that could be described as like Christ was surrounded by Thebes, because that's actually the field out there that we gain our awareness from uh, as a reflection of our internal singularity point. And so if we are to blame or put all the importance on that, then we'd be overlooking the point. The individual spark, which is actually in this training ground, in this field of awareness, projected on out there. And so this is when like, we see the two pillars. It's like there could be the cerebrum and the seraphim. It's everything that we are learning ourselves through and marrying on it, marinating into the singularity, which is a bit like when you're born through the birth canal, <laughs> uh, which is what Pisces truly is. Just like those twilight hours, it's the darkest just before the dawn because everything's fully aware at that point. But as soon as it is dawn, as soon as it's Aries time, it's just old me going for breakfast, going to do press ups, going for a shower, brushing my teeth. It's all of these different things. It's not like, wow, look at this whole grandiose experience, which I am also. Yep, good, exactly. So it's kind of a, a humbling sign, isn't it? It's um, teachers want to lose the ego. It's all about losing the ego, serving others, Service is very strong there, also in Virgo. That's why Jesus serves the crowds with uh, fish and bread, both um, emblematic of uh, Pisces and Virgo, respectively. The Virgin is there to serve, and the fish are a service sign as well, especially dealing with losing one's ego and um, emptying themselves of that, you know, um, controlling device and being more universal. Piscines are very good at being universal and, and um, working in the community. The only problem is flakiness and not committing, but um, they're great for keeping things in order, tidying up and um, yeah, uh, bringing a sense of oneness. I've been really big working with this the past couple of weeks because it came up even in some birth chart readings with clients uh, who was holding these, the sun in Virgo, and that's Mary Magdalene. The sun would have it off with Mary in the day, but then go home to Eve at night in the evening. He wouldn't spend the evening out. He wouldn't get caught out. He'd spend it with Eve because he knows what's best for him, does the sun. It's good to rest. Can't talk all the time. You've got to punctuate it with spaces. And you also have to give Eve space in the day. Thank goodness, she would say, I bet, no doubt. So this is what I've been working with, but if we're dealing with the opposite sign of Pisces, which is opposite from Mary Magdalene's sign. Obviously this is like the sun's coming back to the day at that point. It's not gonna be long, you know, before the sun's with Mary once more. So, it's a happy time for the sun to be coming back at Pisces time because of the potential that can be done throughout the day that's going to be brought forth. But with this, also with Aries, it's this more individual. Eve kind of loves it. I mean, Libra loves the fact that it's left to its own devices to pontificate and ruminate and to think about the other. But the fact that the sun does what it wants and does itself, keeps itself to itself in the daytime is quite admittable, quite uh, specifically beneficial as well. And um, this is the beautiful language of astrology, isn't it? Yes. Yep. It only gets more and more rich the more that we learn to perceive it. This is like the wine uh, as we continue to devote ourselves every day, then our, our connection to astrology and our connection to ourselves and the way that we embody it is only going to be more profound for each one of us individually, how we choose to express it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yep. Yeah, as for um, being expressive and um, uh, insightful and deep and penetrating, Pisces uh, don't have any problem with that. You know, the one fish is going deep in the waters and bringing up you know, uh, deep understandings. So understanding is their great, great strength. But on the negative side, they, they're not so understood. They, they get very frustrated with their 
flip-floppy emotional nature. So they tend to uh, get frustrated. That no one understands them. They're all about uh, understanding others. You know, they have this um, empathy. And um, but Michael Jackson and and Jung, they were they, these were like complex individuals, like right, um, like and the acquisition of wealth doesn't really mean so much to these people or any power. Uh, it's all about what you maybe can achieve and what you can disrupt. It's almost like an artistic, um, it can be an artistic observation of life in, at play in general. Because you can see the beauty in like a rainy day that's dawning or in a beautiful sunny day that's dawning or something that's coming to the end, like a long, long night is and also another perspective which you can can perceive because of the time of the day. It's also the winter, isn't it? If depending obviously where you are, but it's but in the natural organic zodiac, it's the last months of winter. The seeds that are there at that stage have all of the potency inscribed, ready to germinate, ready to bloom again for the new season. Sure. Exactly. That's a good point because it's the sign preceding the equinox. So it's the last of the winter and it's handing over to the power of the sun where he exalts in, uh, in Aries. So it's, it's really a launch pad for the sun and uh, the sun is grateful. In Pisces, there are always the days of Lent and Christians always eat fish on Friday during Lent. Lent means to lengthen. And in Pisces, it is noticeable how the days are lengthening. You can really feel summer coming on from the, from the moment Pisces kicks in. It doubles the heat, just as Gemini does preceding Cancer. As Bonatti says, the, the twins double the heat. And so Pisces doubles this energy as well. Um, but the greatest change happens in the mutable signs. Exactly. That's what mutable means, to mutate, to change. So Pisces mutates winter into spring. That's the work of Pisces. And so you could suggest that they, when we're dealing with a planet, like they've got an inverse and an outburst, just like how we've got an internal and an external. And so that you should say that Jupiter in Sagittarius is the external version of Jupiter, whereas maybe the Pisces is the internal representation of Jupiter. It is. Mm -hmm. So it's 100%. You could say again, you want to give it another label. It's like the positive and the minus or the masculine and the feminine. Mm. The fire and the water. And so when we're dealing with that, it's uh, how we can internalize our own magnetic sphere, isn't it? It's like how you become the great attractor. Pisces is like very powerful and bringing things in towards it you know if you stay up at that if you stay up that late then you might be tempted to stay up and watch the sun the sun rise or you might be tempted to to complete something even more when you know that the spring's coming along you're going to give it your all yeah for sure dreamers and visionaries are what they are but uh, dreamers is definitely something, you know, they've always got something that they're conjuring up that they've dreamt about, you know, oh, I dream about this, you know, I, I really would love to see this and that. And um, that's another thing of their nature. I've got a bit of that. I'm Didn't a little bit like that. Very hopeful, you know, always hopeful, hoping, hoping. Do you use um, it, maybe you use this in everyday life, for example, in the sense that maybe it could, let's talk about a couple of examples. So for instance, you might have a, a gig coming on up and you might be like, okay, I'm going to attend this gig, but first thing, I'm gonna put a bit of nuance on how I think it might go. And that is the daydream capacity. That's like the 12th house capacity. And so we kind of put in our own, own tone or blend on these certain things, because the more that we give gravitas or weight or magnetism, energy in general to it is like how we're telling the story. Yes. Spot on. That like Brahman's cave. And so this Brahman is the, uh, the, 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 the deity on the pineal dreaming on up the whole reality. So this is like our vow or coming into that part of our experience. And so if there's something that we, for instance, if we've got doubt about, so we're like, oh, I don't know if they're going to show up or I don't know if she's going to like me or I don't know if 
uh, I'm going to feel great about this or whatever have you, then we're adding to it. But what we do is we learn to boost ourselves up with reaffirming our confidence with certain things or reassuring ourselves with certain things rather than going too far off adrift into the doubts or even getting too confident about a certain thing, <laughs> you know? So we've got to kind of bring ourselves back to that middle, back to that sacred center. Uh, otherwise we're going, we're going to fall off our horse. Yeah, good point. Good point. So that one fish can always be monitoring the other fish, you know, and they can see how one takes control during certain moments and parts of the day. And so they can bring it back in. It's good to have a little bit of doubt, you know. Uh, if you don't have a little bit of doubt, well, then maybe you will uh, suffer with overconfidence and uh, overreach. So doubting that little bit of fear, it's always good to um, keep it in measure and control it, but um, have it there, you know. So Pisceans are able to do that if they master their emotional um, flippant uh, nature. If, if, they, if they're able to take control of that, um, they're able to monitor themselves and correct themselves. And in the story of the Nakshatras that fall, actually falls over Pisces, it's actually that it all starts there because it's a loop, it's a chain, it's a story, it's a tale, time is just this circle. And so the craft actually is told that it's began in this spark of the story. It's set into motion in the 12th in, in, in Pisces. And so basically it's this, uh, like the conception of the day, the, the, those first moments when you dawn, even if it's not at that ridiculous time of the day, if you're someone, I'm not often up at that time of the day. I was a few days ago, I wanted to see Venus being in the morning star, uh, which I have not yet seen because it was cloudy and rainy here. Uh, but like the, the point is, is that the first moments of where we program our day and their pattern, they're often something which we're very familiar with, like the way we tell the day. Hopefully it's not a grumble. Hopefully it's something uplifting, something that's going to get us bouncing out of bed, something that's going to give us joy. But obviously sometimes there's hindrances that like, we might fall into every day. If you might be a parent, it's not maybe a hindrance. It could be a joy. But if you've got to get up and, you know, it's, you've got to be able to kind of prescribe to the self so that we're able to tell the story. I think this is the greatest thing that astrology lends to. And knowing the potency of, of um, how lucid the energy is in those first moments, the Piscean malleability is a, like a clay that we're the sculptor of. It's very important that we recognize to go into the play rather than the drama and to go into the, to the empowerment rather than into the victimhood, which is, very oceanic. Yep. Good point, brother. So that well, was... um, can we finish off with just a, a point about to the day cycle of Pisces? I just want to finish off with this point because um, I've, I've got uh, something to attend to. <laughs> but um, it's, Pisces is that moment before sunrise. Aries is sunrise. So it's the two hours before sunrise. It's the coldest part of the day. And it's that moment of stillness, the most still part of the day, cold and still, four to six, that launches the day. So that's the energy in the daily cycle. We've done the yearly. We know it's the end of winter. But in the daily cycle, it completes the night. So think about that as a Piscean. You know, you've... You're at the end of the night, whereas Virgo opposite is at the end of the day, four to six at sunset. Pisces is four to six in a.m. at sunrise. So that is the condition of Pisces, that darkness coming into the light and illumination, right? So they are the ones that see the sun first, the twilight, and then they go off and they leave the sun. They, you know, they tag the sun and they say, off you go, serve mankind. So that's where the idea of service comes from. You see, out of the fish comes Venus, out of the seashell, and Venus exalts in Pisces. So it's all about toroidal electromagnetic energy. And Pisces is that sign which is about to emerge into the daylight, but it is part of the darkness, which means it is of the modality of going within. 
and seeking truths within by losing the ego and and um, being awakened. There's their gift to be awakened at the end of night. Oh, goodness. But it's, it's a bit that uh, you said something amazing, which brought back to the sentence that I was already daydreaming and holding on to. It's profound. It's this loop. We go through the loop every single day. And in that moment when we're still dreaming, we are still the dream. We are the Godhead. We are the sorcerer. We're the source. We're the magi. We're everything we could potentially ever want to be. But then that stillness comes. And in that moment, we recognize, yeah, shit. I'm still human. I'm back. It's another day. But if we recognize that we were that God, we still are that I am. We always shall be. And we are also the way. We're the way teller. We're the storyteller. And so we're the way shower of this grand cosmic expedition. This is the 12th sign. We've been through all of them at this point. This is a very powerful playlist we're, we're putting together. If you haven't watched all, them all from Aries all the way through, which we started a couple of years ago, then check them all out because this is a very valuable resource. But the more that, and more that we come tighter into our own storytelling through our knowledge of the Zodiac, the greater our lives will be, the greater clearance that we get when we recognize that being human is a gift. And we are that gift. The stillness in those moments that we can gather from all the hysteria, all the nebula, all the craziness, well, that is our presence. And so thank you so much for showing up and for finishing and for, for being consistent and persistent throughout this series with us, Santos. It's been really great to be able to make this contribution for the people and for ourselves. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, brother. It's been great working with you. Always is. And I look forward to Tulum on the 26th, where uh, we'll both be speaking at the presentation that you're hosting, eh? It's going yes, to be great. Astro Tulum. Anybody interested can get your tickets below. It's not too late. We still have some spaces available. Love to connect together with you in Tribe. It's going to be great to meet you again, Santos, and to hang out and to listen to your presentation. What are you going to be talking about? Um, geocentrism and how astrology proves it. Fantastic. We're getting centered. We're coming into ourselves. And I'm very excited to connect with you there, Santos, and everybody else. As I say, the tickets are available in the link in the description. If you're watching this on Mr. Astro Theology YouTube, check out the playlist with on my YouTube, Unifying Perspectives, for all of my videos with Santos, all 12 of them, and a few others as well. They are also on this channel. What a fantastic collection of information that you've produced over the years, Santos. I'm really grateful for these collaborations. Thank you, everybody, for watching and for sharing. Thank you for being who you are. You are a vital facet. Each one of us is so valuable. I'm grateful for you. Thank you, Santos. Thanks, brother.